we make it is like sounds very serious today. So so I would like to like uh to be interactive a bit. All right. You know there's a chat there's a chat room there, right? Can you please put uh what you are is like as if uh as in you are medical students, you are nurses, uh you are physical coach, or you are any other occupation, just write in the chat group. Uh so I know roughly the demography of this audience today. Uh, yeah. Remember to send to the meeting group chat. Uh. Don't, don't send directly to anybody else. <laughs> uh, let's start the borrowing. Oh, some, something somebody put in already. Yeah, I, I issue is a medical medical answer, medical for IMU. Yeah. <laughs> uh, medical student. Oh, okay. Most of most of these uh medical students are uh, oh from UPN. Okay, my automator, UPN. All right. Okay. IMU or IMU. Right. Oh, most I think I guess most of those are medical students here, right? All right. So uh so this actually I do not think this in the syllabus, right? I don't think it's in the syllabus. Uh but uh it's good to know. And it's actually one of my niche for bariatric, metabolic and bariatric surgery. And then, oh yeah, so I couldn't wish you all happy Father's Day, right? But maybe some of you, uh, you know, uh, illegitimate father, also happy Father's Day. Lah. <laughs> okay, just joking. Oh, still medical student coming in. All right, so, all right. So um, about this uh, metabolic and bariatric surgery, um now I just going to start the service. It's not only in Baratrip but also upper GI. But the thing is uh my niche is actually uh metabolic and diabetic surgery, or we call it MBS, right? So this is my hospital, my my I'm going to go here in July first. So Enche Bursa Haja Kaosong is in Kruang. For those of you who don't know who is Kruang, it's actually central Joho. So this is the hospital. It's a very small hospital, but I love it. All right. Small is good. All right. Uh, disclaimer, I am actually affiliated to Hill program. Right. So I'm affiliated to Jane. Uh, this, I think um, I met with Joanna. All right. I met with Joanna in Taiwan and uh, she actually kind enough to invite me as a guest speaker today and to speak to you guys about this, uh, this topic. So feel free to ask any question. You can just type in the chat box, right? And uh, there is also I think there's a Q and A. You can just put it there, then we will see. It. All right. So, but one thing is this is a cut cut out of a newspaper. This is from Trace Timer, huh? and this is not this is not something very old. It's quite new. It's in last month, May sixteen, right? So half a million, half a million is 500k, 500k Malaysian adults have diabetes, hypertension, cholesterol, and plus with the obesity. So what does it mean? This is actually a metabolic syndrome, right? So what it meant is that is more than half a million. It might be 99999999, right? Of Malaysia, it can it can say like that, right? But uh, if you look at the Malaysian population, it in since uh, 20, 2021, it's thirty three million, right? Thirty three million, and uh, this half more than half a million of adults. It seems like a small number, but uh, if you compare to thirty three million, right? But one thing is uh, you must understand this directly. Uh, metabolic and bariatric surgery is nothing but all about metabolic syndrome and also morbid obesity right okay so this is something very very specific and that's why i that's why i think this is uh it's not in your syllabus and because it is so specific even uh some of the general surgeon also we sometimes we get confused as well but uh, today, you guys are going to be the experts, right? You are uh, going, going to be an expert in all these uh, metabolic and bariatric surgery, lah, hopefully. All 
all right for this telling me how to rent and rent because this is medical students the audience is medical students so i go very very fundamental all right so body mass index if joanna actually knows me i hate a bmi okay <laughs> i'll tell you why okay bmi is body mass index because it's very not accurate it's not accurate at all but this is one of the criteria for us to know if the patient is a morbid obesity or not. So you use weight in kilogram, all right? Don't use ounce, uh, okay? <laughs> okay. And then height in meters, but height is a, a square, okay? Faster dual, uh, we are Malaysian here, right? Okay, so height in square. So that you get the index, which is a BMI, all right? So, uh, okay. Uh, host, maybe you can just mute. Okay, then. No, one thing is a BMI based weight classification for adults. This is for more than 18 years of age. Why 18 years of age? Because pediatric population, adolescents, BMI is another topic, right? For bariatric and uh, metabolic. And then this uh, underweight, you see the, the index for Asian country, right? Malaysian is inside asia right okay so we are also asian country right so we we do not use the american standards we do not use the international standard in which if you say it's an obese class one is 30 33 0.0 but we have to reduce 2.5 so if you later on later you guys check all right okay then i can assure you all right one, two out of one, you guys are actually here at, at least pre or bis. All right, later I show you a statistics. All right, so that's why this is something very interesting and actually it's quite concerning. It's quite concerning in Malaysia, right? That's why this is one of the thing, one, one of the concern and I would like to venture myself into uh, to help to make Malaysia healthier. Right? Right. So if you look at this pre or is 23. Yeah? If you are BMI 23, you are already pre or Right. And if you look at obese class two, obese class two is actually or what we doubt as morbid obesity. All right. And morbid obesity is actually 32.5 and above. Right. And what if the BMI is more than 40? What do you call that? Anybody knows that? Anybody knows that? What if more than 40? You see, this is obesity class 3, 37.5. What if it's more than 40? Morbidly obesity. <laughs> Another LY, huh? very good. Good try. Okay. <laughs> we call it super obese. All right. Okay. So we have super obese. We have super, super obese. Now we have mega obese. I don't know later on with giga, giga or this or not. <laughs> I tell you, that, that is the problem with, uh, with the weight. Okay, that is actually called a set point theory. There's a set point theory is that uh, for a human being, they would like to increase their weight. Like they would like to increase their weight as, as high as possible. There is no stop. Right, so the only thing that can reverse it, right, if you are already a morbid obesity, which is a 32.5, right, actually, a metabolic and bariatric surgery is the way to go. Okay, so this is, uh, this is actually very freshly baked statistic. I think this is only came out uh, last month. Uh, the, the statistic is uh, 2023. And if you look at that, 2023, our obesity, this is actually BMI 25. Uh, why use 25? Because internationally, we define overweight as 25, but not in Malaysia, we have 2023. But this one, we can roughly know the, the, the statistic of obesity, which is 54.4%. What does it mean by 54.4%? All right, if you guys, now, now it's Zoomer, very difficult to say 
Okay, now we have uh, how many of us here? We have uh, 36. Nice, 36 participants here. That means 33 of us is already BMI 25. That is what statistics is all about. So this is actually very concerning. If you look beside your, your friend, your friend is actually is either your friend is obesity or you are obese. Okay. So that is what 34.4% means. So why obesity is very important is because the complication of the Bobby obesity. The complication is start from head to toe. This is actually a known fact. We have known this for decades. But uh, why why we don't do anything about it? Yeah, that is a question, right? That is a million million dollar question. All right. So if you the most important is the cardiac, the renal, the gastrointestinal, which is the fatty liver, it can also cause uh, liver cirrhosis uh, in the end, and it can cause pulmonary, right? So all in all, you can divide this into metabolic complication, all right, or mechanical complication, mechanical complication in which is the musculoskeletal, which is your osteoarthritis. It can get pain, it can present with back pain, it can even present with spondylosis. So that's why obesity is something that will kill Malaysians, right? So, but, uh, just now I said, I hate BMI. Why I hate BMI? Because BMI doesn't tell you how obese or is obese. How obese you are obese. So how, how to track obesity? So today, i like to introduce you this thing. It's called Body Impedance Analysis of BIA. So um, the problem with BIA, this, B, this BIA is actually quite long already. I think since 19, since 1980s, the 1920s, sorry, 1920s. But the one thing is, why is it not so popular? Imagine my ward, if you guys in my ward, okay, my previous hospital ward, right? The patients are weightless. Huh? Most of our patients are weightless. So why are patients are weightless? Because the nurses are burnt out. The nurses are burnt out. The patients are not being weighed. So that is the problem. If you want to get BMI, it's a problem. What more you want to get the BIA? But one thing is, if you if you really, really wanted to treat obesity and metabolic syndrome, you must always get the BIA. BIA is not any other weighing scale. It's a special scale. The cheapest one, I think, is 30K. RM, lah. right? So what is the advantage? Of this BIA machine, you can know the high patient. You will know the most important is a fat free mass, right? That which is the muscle mass. You uh, then you have your fat mass, you have uh, skeletal muscle mass, or so this is actually very specific skeletal muscle mass and fat free mass, right? So you will come up with something like this, a report like that, right? As what Joanna told, told you guys, I was I was in a China medical. Right. In China Medical, there is an obesity uh, medical center. So they, are, they, are, they only do bariatric and metabolic surgery. Only. That is all that they do. Right. One year, they can go up to 700 to 800 cases. So but what they did is every patient, they have BIA. Right. So this is in Chinese, but I translated for you. So this is the first one. is a water test. Then you have the protein mass, you have a bone mass, you have a fat mass. So this is what we need to see. We need to uh, identify rather than the BMI. Yes, BMI is, I would say BMI is a screening tool for you to, uh, to, to, to ascertain if the patient needs a bariatric or metabolic surgery or not. But you have to go in depth. In the BIA, which is your the most important thing, is the protein mass and the fat mass. So when you go down further, you will see the muscle mass distribution. The muscle mass distribution, if everything I did of this patient, the particular patient, 
the muscle mass management is quite good, right? This is the right upper lip, left lower lip, uh, left lower upper lip, and this is the torso, and this is the right lower lip, this is the right lower lip, uh, left lower lip. So there are some instances where usually the lower body is uh, inadequate. So this is pertinent to the muscle mass. And the total body water, total body water should be around 30 to around 45%. So this one, she is actually quite good, right? And the best is you can, with the BI machine, you can have a trend of parameters where this is the total weight. The patient is from 74.3 kg. And this is over the course of uh, four months, like three months, the course of three months. So then he has already reduced to 73.2. And the most important thing is SMM is a skeletal muscle mass. The skeletal muscle is not being reduced. If you look at from his uh, weight loss journey, all right, he is actually, he lost a few muscle mass here, but it's eventually picked up. He really picked up, right? So, and this peripheral body fat, uh, and the most important is the body fat. The body fat from 31% to 30%. This is actually very really good. It's quite good already. And the water is actually, we just want to look at the water. Sometimes the problem in Malaysian also, Malaysian, we don't take water. Uh. We, we like to take Bandung. Uh. <laughs> I, I, I see that Bandung. Uh. Or we like to take uh, oh, our favorite Milo dinosaur. Oh my God. Okay. That one is the worst. <laughs> All right. So no, right. You must take more water. Right. If you take more sugar, you convert to fat. So your fat mass will decrease. Right. So, and when we are talking about metabolic surgery, we are talking about metabolic syndrome. And the most important component in the metabolic system is actually type 2 diabetes mellitus. In a lot of papers, have really told us that metabolic surgery is good to reduce the uh, uh from I mean uh it can be reversed actually with a meta metabolic surgery, right? And this is from the insert of this, the guideline. And one, I, I wonder if you guys uh, know what I'm seeing. And this is the overall diabetes. All right. But one thing is, this is a survey. It's a survey that has been done nationwide. Uh, all right. And those with diagnosed and non diabetes, right, really diagnosed and non diabetes, and they took their fasting blood sugar. And uh, they diagnosed again to become diabetes is 11%. But the most important is this. The population with no symptoms, uh, apparently no symptoms, raised plasma glucose of more than seven. This is actually a uh, diabetes, right? And they are not known to have diabetes. But if you look at these two arms, these are the patients maybe already on treatment. Right, ready been uh sought uh what is this uh uh have already been sought uh treatment and uh follow up from the doctors, but the problem is this um these patients are the one that is concerning. Why? Because they never they never know apparently have no symptoms. Later I'll tell you what are the symptoms. Right. I think you guys must know what are the symptoms as well. And usually they have, they have symptoms, but they don't know they have symptoms. That is the problem, right? So you see both arms are the same. 11%, this is around 11%, all right? 8% and this is right around 7%, right? 8.5%, 18% and this is 13%, 5% and this is 6%. This is even, this is even worse, right? Because they those remember these are the patients that doesn't have any uh uh treatment attention, right? So the others also others are like uh, this is not Muniputra, others others are like, like foreigners, all right, okay, which are not in the in the in the survey, right? So but this is more, right? So this is actually very concerning. And 
as a students, as a doctors, I think every doctor, even though you are surgeon as well, I don't care you are surgeon or you are in administrative later on, you should actually know the most fundamental factors, which is the type 2 diabetes mellitus. And the symptoms of type 2 diabetes mellitus are actually quite vague. Static, lethargy, right? Polyuria, yeah, this is the triad, huh? polyuria, nocturia, and polyxia, right? Polyuria means a lot of urine, right? Nocturia means they pass urine at night, usually two to three times. And polydixia, they are they always say they are thirsty, right? Polyphagia, they like to eat, they have hunger, they have a lot of they are always feel hungry. And weight loss, huh? If you have a weight loss, it doesn't mean that you you are very good, right? And this is without treatment. Huh? If with treatment is different story. This is without treatment, with weight loss, it means that their diabetes is not well controlled. That's why they have weight loss. After the weight loss, then they increase, right? And puritis bovale and balanitis, the genitalia will start to have uh, itchiness and all. So you must have these symptoms, all right? Actually, one symptom is enough. And you plus another, yeah, you have three. There are so many uh, criteria for you to diagnose, right? There's a venous plasma glucose. You have an OGTT test. You can also use a HbA1c. My my personal favorite is actually HbA1c. And mind you, venous plasma glucose is not the we call deep stick, uh, right? The capillary blood glucose that that is not accurate. You must take from the vein. All right. So how to remember this? Seven Eleven. All right. I'm not I'm not promoting Seven Eleven lah. It's just let you guys do. All right. To remember better. All right. And because we are doing metabolic surgery, right? So we must understand what is metabolic syndrome, right? Metabolic syndrome is according to ITF, which is the International Diabetes Convention. This is 2006. Uh. This is, I think this is the latest definition. You must have a central obesity. So what is a central obesity? It means that the waist conference, right? For male is uh forty inch uh, okay so for female is thirty five right so female slimmer ma, right usually <laughs> female are slimmer la. and the one thing is uh, you must plus another any of the two or the following of four two out of four which is the TG level you can have the HDL level HDL cholesterol level and also the blood pressure. Right, this is you either or systolic or diastolic, right? Or you already been treated as a hypertension, and also fasting plasma glucose, or we call it FDS, right? Fasting blood glucose, blood sugar, right? So this um uh, hundred uh milli milligram per deciliter is a five point six milli more per liter than what we use in Malaysia, right? So if the patient have a you always say sang kao, right? Sorry, uh, in Chinese, uh, right? In Malay, in, in Malay, always tiga tinggi, right? But other tiga tinggi, what other tiga tinggi? High blood pressure, high blood glucose, high cholesterol. So this is necessary the metabolic input, right? There is one caveat here, very, very important. The central obesity is if the BMI is more than 30, right? You are already considered as a central obesity, all right? That means all the patients that come for MBS are actually metabolic syndrome if they have diabetes and hypertension, that's it, right? So this is actually quite uh, discerning, nah? okay? So before I move on and let me see the chat box, what link issue as what is considered an acceptable amount of body fat, all right, for male, Asian male, uh, for Asian male, age 40 and below, right? Why 40? Because after 40, it's a bit of a different story idea. Yeah? Okay, for you guys are all students here, right? So 40 and below, I will consider for female will be around 20. If 20% 20 of body fat, you will look like a model already. All right, for male is 25. 
right? So that I hope that uh that will answer your question. But you don't want to go too less. It's like I want zero body fat. No lah, they can you cannot achieve that lah. All right, uh, maybe I want to achieve ten percent. But I tell you, ten percent you look classic. You are you are you don't look very nice. So I would say maybe for female, fifteen to twenty percent body fat will be acceptable. Will be the best, right? For male. Uh, sorry, for female is 20, uh, 20 to 25. For male is 15 to 20. Why? Because female have more body fat. All right. And then you guys know where the body fat come, goes to. Lah, huh? All right. The humps and the bumps. Huh? All right. So the principle of... Uh, okay. So before I go there, the metabolic and bariatric surgery. Ah, uh, yeah. 20 to 25 for women. And uh, this is for age less than 40. For more than 40, you can add another 5%. Right, that means for more than 40, uh, for female will be 25 to 30, so for male will be uh, 20 to 25 for more than 40. Right, so metabolic and bariatric surgery this is the best metabolic surgery, okay? All right, which is suture the mouth, la. in suture the mouth, they cannot eat, la. that's the best. I can tell you 100% excess weight loss, all right, in one month. So the what is the problem with MBS? It's the principle. So currently the principle of MBS, traditionally we have a restrictive mechanism. We also have malabsorptive mechanism. Don't worry, I will going to describe about this later. And this is a traditional uh, uh, pathophysiology on what we think, right? what the surgeons think for the past decade. But now the modern with a newer perspective, actually bariatric surgery, metabolic and bariatric surgery is a hormonal surgery. We have a foregut theory, we have a hindgut theory. All right. Okay. So what are they? Restrictive. Let's say restrictive. It's very easy. I just uh, put, maybe I put a band, all right, over the stomach. Right, so the stomach will get distended. Once the stomach get distended, you will have reduced hunger, right? Okay, you reduce more hunger, but the, there's a big stomach below that. So this is a restrictive. You try to restrict the food intake of the patient. So what you do is this is this is a picture of an adjustable band, nah, but uh, we don't look at that. We are looking. We are looking at the procedure later on. What I want you to focus on now is the restrictive mechanism, right? So what you can do is restrictive, you always go to the stomach where you want to reduce the stomach, right? Like for this diagram, this is the RYGB, eh? the rule and Y gastric bypass. And you see the gastric pouch is only very small, okay? They're so small that the patient unable to eat, right? So that is a restrictive point of view. And on the other hand, you have a mouth absorptive point of view. Mouth absorptive, what does it mean? It means we bypass the intestine. So if we bypass the intestine, you look, esophagus, the patient eat cat. Oh, now we okay, eat KFC already, uh, boycott already, right? Uh, many brown, uh, <laughs> homegrown, all right? So you eat many brown, or oh, okay, uh, now it's very sensitive. You can take fried chicken, all right? So you take whatever uh, fried chicken, Esophagus go into the pouch, and you have already bypassed right the intestine, right? So this is the mouth absorptive point of view. Okay, so the food, how does the human body digest food? And in uh, uh, in turn eventually will cause a uh, absorption. You need bowel. Right, you need bowel because you need vaccine, you need renin, right? You need lipase, you need amylase. Of course, amylase for saliva, but the amylase from pancreas is more important, right? So you need all this enzyme to digest the food component in order for your body to get absorbed. So what you do is you put this long. This is a non-scale diagram. Eh? Usually depending on the patient, on the surgeon. Some surgeon, they can put 75 centimeter, but I think it's rather very short. 
or some surgeon they put 100 or 150 right and for this they put maybe 75 or also 100 to 150 so all in all it might be 150 to 300 right so you we actually we must know the normal population the total bowel length the total bowel length is how much now that is the problem we when we do a rygb because rygb we only look at above the problem is the technicality of counting the bowel so most of the surgeons they don't count the total bowel length so that is the thing right um i actually i have a study and i'm published i can tell you for at least for taiwanese population is about 300 to 1000 that is the population of 800 cases and uh, the total power length because we, we we routinely calculate our power length so that is that is the 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 range you see the range is so so varied so that is that is the problem that is why i actually i advocate to calculate the total power length for all the patients right but okay so enough said the problem with that is let's say this patient is 600 so you already bypass let's say 300 right so you only have 300 uh intestine to digest and absorb so that is what we call malabsorptive right let's let's go to the anatomy of the tetri bypass i think uh this this is actually it won't come out in exam anyway this topic won't come out in exam okay but at least for you budding surgeon right you are all a new budding surgeons you are going to become my colleague maybe in the five to ten years time all right so i shall tell you the anatomy of a gastric bypass which is actually because gastric bypass is a gold standard and from the gastric pouch right towards the bifurcation or the anastomosis or we call it a common common channel right this is what we call elementary or dual limb right and the one from the duodenum towards the common channel which is what we call the bilio pancreatic because bowel bilio pancreatic limb right okay this is another limb is very very important this thing and of course the common channel right so you have if you are going to do a by by bypass which is a rygb right you will have a blue limb or alimentary limb you will have a bpl a bilio pancreatic limb and also a common channel right so and the most important is the blue limb and plus the common channel you become the total elementary or or we call it tal because this is the limb that is functional all right okay so these are the terms to use for the anatomy and mind you if you are going to there are a lot of ways to do a rigb but um here I just want to show you the RYGB will cause internal herniation and the, those are the defects. If you are a surgeon, you have to close this defect. A is the transverse colon defect, B is a Patterson, and C is a jejunal defect. All right. So is it important for your exam? No. You will come out from your exam? No. <laughs> okay. But later on, when you are going to be a bariatric surgeon, this is very important because you must close all these defects, lah. right? Okay, so we go to the more interesting perspective, which is the gut hormone. Little that we know that actually gut produces at least five gut hormones. Lah. And these hormones are actually being extensively researched and studied. And at least we know a few of them. The foregut, the foregut means the from the ligament of traits. All right. So we are not saying that these hormones are only been secreted in the foregut, but it's more dominant in the foregut. All right. So there is a difference. Huh? Right. So that means the small intestine actually they, they would have a little amount in which actually we are still uh, not so uh good at that because it's not have really been it will, even though it's been extensively researched but we don't have the answer yet but one thing is the most uh, popular 
hormone into the ghrelin. The ghrelin, initially we thought it was only in the fundus, but actually it's in the whole stomach. The whole stomach is secreting ghrelin. And this ghrelin is the one that causes hunger. Then come hunger sensation. All right, that is ghrelin. Right? So how does be ghrelin being secreted? Is when your stomach is collapsed. When your stomach is collapsed, your stomach will secrete ghrelin and ask and signal your brain to go and eat. All right. And there was also PYY and also CCK. Ah, your favorite CCK. Ah? They call it the cholecystokinin, kinin, right? And also high gut. So for because you guys, most of you are students here, I just want to tell you ghrelin for for gut and high gut is GLP1. Eh? Or like glucagon, glucagon like peptide one, type one. And GLP1 has been a very big uh money making uh, uh material, I mean a factor, right? Okay, because this can come in the injection form, can come in the oral form. And this GLP1 most are being secreted in the distal ileum. It will, and GLP1 will increase your satiety. So how does GLP-1 be secreted? It's all it's just that the food, the time, right, has been uh ha, ha, has been bypassed into the distal ileum, and that one will be secreted. And it, the uh, small intestine, the distal ileum, will tell your brain that okay, you eat enough. Okay, that's satiety. All right. So you must remember hunger. Satiety and cetacean, they are three different things. All right. Okay. So, and also GIP. GIP is another, another new thing, lah, another new kit. All right. So, I, I blah, 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 so much. Lah. Okay. The one thing is, what is foregut theory? If we look at the perspective of a hormonal surgery, all right. Sleep. Sleep, gastrectomy. It can be, if you look at the perspective of restrictive. Yes, it's a restrictive procedure as well because the patient can only eat so much, so and so much. It depending on the surgeons. Some surgeon will take 50 meals, some surgeon will take 100 meals, 150 meals. But one thing, if you look at the foregut theory, just now I said foregut is ghrelin, right? All right. Or what is the exact difference? We discuss later on. <laughs> okay. So the gastric sleeve, we're taking a bit. 70%, 70% of the stomach out. That means the 70% of the ghrelin secreting, or we call it L cells, all right, have been taken out. So this will cause uh, less hunger to the patient. All right. So if you look at restrictive, some surgeon will just say, oh, no, 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 you, you must, you, you, you shouldn't too much, it's too, too, too restricted. All right, but if you look at the hormonal perspective, you would like to take as much of the stomach out as possible. If you look at the RYGB, there is a random stomach there, right? Remember the random stomach there. That's why RYGB also cause a weight regain. That is why another one problem with weight regain, All right? Okay, high gut, high gut is the GLP one. So this geodonal switch. Jordanus switch is one of the, you know, the ceiling, uh, okay, the most difficult procedure, bilateral proce procedure, right, there is a ceiling already. So you can do a Jordanus switch in which you must look at the difference between Jordanus switch and RYGB. RYGB, you already take out the pylorus, but Jordanus switch is at the diodenum, it's a diodenum jejunal anastomosis. So, the duodenum is uh you still have the pylorus, right? That makes a lot of difference, huh? Pylorus is your friend, right? But one thing is they will calculate how much is the intestine, and usually depending on the surgeon, it can have 200 up to 350, right? So it should depend on patient uh, of the surgeon and also not really depend on surgeon, or also the patient as well. All right. Some patients will need 250. Some patients will need 300 of the common channel. All right. So 
if you have a lesser common channel, all right. So if you have a more GLP will be increased because more food will get into the distal ileum. All right, understand this, huh? So this will, it will increase the GLP one. All right. So uh, we come to issues. Uh, this one. What is the difference between satiety, satiation, and also hunger? All right, hunger. We look. We talk about hunger first. You guys ever feel hang hungry? All right. When you feel hungry, you hungry, right? You angry and hungry, so hungry, right? So so if you feel hungry, right, that is a sensation of uh, you need to eat something, right? That is hunger, all right. Satiety, satiety. You you already feel, uh, you don't feel anything. You don't want to eat anymore. That is satiety, all right. Satiation, satiation is you feel full, right. Satiation is like wow, I really feel already. I think if you go to, uh, buffet, right. You guys are students, right. You guys like to go to buffet, right. So you guys go to buffet and until satiation, all right? Okay. Even though you already have satiety, but you eat until you have satiation, right? So that is the difference. And this is actually quite scientific term. If you want to look at a scientific term, um, that there is a very really long definition. You can you can look up actually. Or uh, after this, you can ask me again. Then I will tell you the exact term. But that the concept is there. So there are three different things, hunger, satiation, and satiety. I hope this one answer your question. Eh? All right. Okay. Feel full after eating. Very cannot muscle already. Yeah. Very good. Very good. <laughs> no, satiety is you, you don't feel like to eat, not full. It, it's not feeling full. Satiety is you don't feel you like to eat. Right. Hunger, you want to eat. Right. So you are like a predator. You want to eat something. All right, I don't feel like eating. Yeah, I don't feel like eating. Okay, later you saw uh the the depression. Later on, we can find the the real definition because the words the wordings are very specific. Okay, so this is what we do in uh China medical and the types of MBS intervention, right? So what are the types of in of uh intervention? The gold standard currently, according to IFSO, is still RIGB, eh? the rule and why gastric bypass. So this is something quite traditional and gold standard. Why is it gold standard? Right, gold standard doesn't mean that it is the best. Eh? All right, gold standard means that everybody can do it. And this is actually a procedure which can be used as a rescue procedure, like something wrong with your sleeve and then you can revert back to RIGB, something wrong with your OAGB and then you can revert back to RIGB. But RIGB, personally, I don't really advocate it. Uh. Right? Okay, so for surgical and non-surgical. So for surgical, we have a lab adjustable gastric band. And don't worry, all these procedures are going to describe one, one, one by one. We have, we have one hour with me, right? Okay. <laughs> And you have BPD, which is a video pancreatic diversion. You have a I we call it mini gastric bypass or one anastomosis gastric bypass. We have sleeve. Uh, this is the most popular procedure nowadays, right? We have sleeve plus. We have sleeve plus means we sleep and then we plus another procedure. Sleep plus. In sleep plus we have sedis, right? We have sleeve and diodonal uh diodonal switch, right? And also PJB. PJB is a proximal jejunal bypass. And we also have a non-surgical um, intervention. All right. And we have an intragastric balloon. We have a endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. We also have a post. Right. So post 2.0, there's a point post 1.0, there's a post 2.0. Uh, for me, I can do all this, but the problem is I don't advocate as well because you know why? All these are still at the restrictive, more absorptive theory, right? They are still thinking at the restrictive there. They are not thinking of hormonal. If you think about it, they, they have nothing to do with the hormonal. They don't change any hormones, the gut hormone, 
right for non-surgical that's why um, is it good okay we we describe later on right so this is the laparoscopy rygb all right this is gold standard all right that's why i said it's gold standard the principle is that it's a restrictive and also a mild absorptive procedure so they, this this rygb has the has the popular for maybe 40 to 50 years right so ha huh, the theory is that this is elementary limb right the longer is your bpl the longer is your bilio pancreatic limb the more mild absorption you will get all right the longer is your elementary limb or low limb the less reflux the patient will get okay so that is another theory you can play around that's why you can play around with the with the limbs right the advantage yes this is one of the best right 70 to 80 percent of excess weight loss you must understand why is excess weight loss excess weight loss is we calculate the target weight at 22.5 bmi right and the rest of the weight is actually assessed weight loss so assessed weight loss in 12 months are usually 70 to 80 percent and this is one of the rescue procedure to be done for the patient we have reflux if you are not doing the mbs uh, the flux is always a problem right so it can also be used as a revisional procedure right you can revision other procedure and you can convert it to become an rygb right what are the advantage this advantage you can see even though it's a gold standard later you will you will uh you will note that there is actually more disadvantage doing the rygb <laughs> okay the most important disadvantage is malnutrition the malnutrition yes protein my favorite protein is always cannot be absorbed and one thing is also because the patient doesn't we didn't address the hunger why because you see they are still ghrelin the stomach is still there it's not been taken out it's only a restrictive part right okay and also usually the one who do rigb they don't calculate the total bowel length because it's actually technically is quite difficult to do all right it's fair enough acceptable but one thing is because if you don't calculate the total bowel length, bowel length and you don't know the total elementary limit how is, is as such so you do not know your glp1 how much will be increased and also another one is the vitamins right why you can see that the difference between the sadis right uh, or pjb and to this is you see it didn't go across the pylorus the pylorus is very very important right the antrum is the one that secrete the intrinsic factor intrinsic factor just hopefully you guys are good in physiology eh? intrinsic factor is very good is very very important for vitamin b12 namely right and also some iron right adoption that's why they also have anemia so the anemia it it can we also we do not really know why the patient with anemia but usually they say iron deficiency but is it iron deficiency hemoglobin is not only heme they also globin right so globin is actually protein can it be because of the amino acid is not enough the adoption of the amino acid right why why adoption of the amino acid not enough right because there's no pylorus right okay so and you look at the stomach the acid fission is much less right the problem with rigb and the problem with uh, most of the mbs is weight regain weight regain three to five years after three to five years their studies have been have been shown weight regain is also in rigb that is the problem we want a permanent solution we don't want a, something temporary right stomach ulcers stomach ulcers is very notorious in rigb the up to 10 to 20 percent 20 percent is a lot uh. five rigb one stomach ulcer stomach ulcer you will have a uh, upper gi bleed uh, right and 
one more thing is the internal herniation. Remember the defects, right? They can go into the defect. It's not if the defects are uh not uh being uh, if not to say the surgeon maybe some surgeon they really they don't they don't close it. Some surgeon they they close it, but one thing is even though they close it, when the patient lost weight, right? And all this all this uh suture become loose, and that one we got the potential defect and become the internal herniation. And the most notorious one is dumping syndrome. Right? Dumping you have uh, early and late, uh, right? So I hope today I haven't uh, saturate your your young minds here. Uh, <laughs> okay. Just to know dumping syndrome is a problem in the uh, RIGB. Okay. So in trunk acid balloon, uh, this thing have been quite commercial. I think you guys in TikTok, in Instagram, in, even in Facebook, all right, you will see there's a company who dance together with the balloon, all right. And one thing is this balloon, if you think of it, what mechanism is that? It's only restrictive, huh? right? It has nothing to do with hormone. But one thing is it will have excess weight loss of a 10 to 20% in four months only. Or as long as the balloon is there, four months because one of the company then about four months. Once the balloon is out, and then the weight regain. But the advantage is it's a clinic procedure, right? Uh, can it be used as a bridging procedure? Hmm. Okay. That one I put a question mark there, right? And one thing is it must couple with a very good team. What team are you talking about? It's a nutrition team. The patient. You must revert like what the Jane today here, right? He, she will try very hard to tell you eat protein. All right, don't eat carbs. All right, <laughs> it's very difficult to do. Eh? All right, and the disadvantage, of course, the weight we gain. Then, the main problem with this procedure is the vomiting, the vomiting at the first week. Why? Because if the patient has not been acclimatized to less food and with a balloon inside, then what they do? They eat and vomit because there's not enough space in the stomach. Vomit is not a problem, actually. But what is the problem? Aspiration. You vomit and you aspirate. Especially, you know, all these, all these patients, they would eat and lie down. Right? Once you eat and lie down, you vomit, you aspirate, right? And there are some rare occasion, bowel obstruction due to rupture balloon. It can because the balloon rupture, you can imagine the balloon rupture is actually uh, some sort like a PTFE, right? And this thing will go into the small intestine and get blocked. It becomes an intraluminal obstruction, right? Then cause IO. Uh. And then if not being careful, the the clinician who put it, it might cause the esophageal perforation. Even though out of thousand, there's one or two, you just need one esophageal perforation, right? The patient will die, right? And one thing is the ESG. ESG has been here maybe for twenty years, but the principle is still it's a restrictive because it's reduce the gastric space. And it will leave a portion of a fundus that will increase the patient. Right? So the excess weight loss for this is quite promising, 40 to 50% in 12 months, and it's a relatively fast procedure. And it can be done endoscopically, or they promoted it as an incisionless because you really have no scar. You all everything do endoscopically. Okay, what is the disadvantage? This advantage is it needs a special endoscopic suturing device. And this device is relatively expensive. Right? And then the weight we gain. But the problem with weight we gain, some advocate they will say we can be ESG. And if you come to a surgeon like me, I will say revision. I will I will revise. Why? Because this thing is not hormonal. This is only a restrictive. Huh? The city point of view is not hormonal, so that is the problem. Okay, post is a primary obesity surgery and low post. There is post one and post two. Now it's a post 
don't worry about post one. Okay, post one is not so good. That's why they have post two, right? It's like bureau of one, bureau of two. All right. So what is the difference? ESG they suture the entrance up to the mid body. Post they suture the funders and the mid body. So that is the difference. But post the the access rate loss is not so good, right? It's only 25 to 40% in 12 months. But the learning curve is shorter and the uh, and the machine uh, is cheaper. Okay. <laughs> All right. And the uh, disadvantage is of course rate regain. Why all this all this procedure have rate regain? Because they are not hormonal perspective. Uh? And a very rare, I would not say very rare, it's actually rare, all right, we have a hepatic access, all right? So why you have a hepatic access? You are actually going through the splenic circulation eh? and you contaminate because remember, the lumen of the bowel is not sterile, eh? right? Okay, so we go to surgical intervention, the LAGB. LAGB was the popular guy all right it was a very very popular uh for maybe 20 years ago 10 to 20 years ago maybe but now it's almost obsolete because there's a lot of problem the problem i tell you right principle is just restrictive right and the advantage is it's very simple it's very fast learning curve is very fast right it's very simple to do and the one thing you can adjust the patient can just adjust. It's like a, you know, like a chemo pot. It's exactly a chemo pot, right? And you can just put the pot under the skin and then you can adjust the restriction. The even disadvantage is it causes a lot of refluxes. And the worst is it causes gastric erosion. And erosions can cause perforation. And the problem with that is also most of them have wet regain after two to three years. And this mostly will need a revision. And I can tell you, you do not like to do a revision on the LAGB. There's too much addition, too much of uh, fibrosis. You will cry, okay? So that's why it's almost obsolete now. Okay, so it's a new kit on the block. This is a OAGB, or we call it mini gastric bypass. Right, it's like a RIGB, but uh, they don't, they keep a... Uh, they keep a quite a this uh big gastric pouch, and remember there is no virus. Uh. Still, there is no virus. It's just a gastric pouch is longer, and also it's not a uh, rule and wine, but it's sort of like a bureau of two, right? So they put in the gas uh, GJ bypass, right? Principle is almost the same as the RIGB, which is restricted and more exotic. Right, it's simple and fast. Yes, it's actually faster than RIGB because RIGB there are two anastomoses. This is only one, and the, the thing is, the access weight loss is only fifty to eighty five percent. Uh, the good thing is the learning curve is short, and there is an ease of anastomotic suturing. That's why most of the newer surgeons nowadays they like to do this. What is the disadvantage? It's very notorious to cause refluxes. 10%. Stoma ulcer is less than RIGP, but still, there is still stoma ulcers, right? 3 to 4%. And yes, there is actually studies have been done, has shown that the malnutrition is actually more than the RIGP. And all these malnutrition, usually they don't present then, then, after the surgery. It only present after 18 months, usually, right? And of course, they can cause dumping syndrome as well. Eh? All right and the uh, okay sleeve sleeve is the most popular bariatric surgery worldwide okay according to if so 2024 this is still the most pop pop popular bariatric right this is your taylor swift lah, huh? all right the principle is this is a uh, restrictive initially we thought this was restrictive but if you look at the four gut theory it's actually hormonal because it reduces ghrelin production 70% of the stomach volume will be taken out, right? Advantage is fast and simple. It's fast and simple, right? You just put in the stapler, pa, 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 pa. that's it, done, right? Yala. Macam senangan, okay? But when you do, it's difficult, right? <laughs> okay. Learning curve is actually very fast. 
quite fast, faster than other procedures, right? The flux search actually can be the when sleep gets sleep gastrectomy first introduced, the problem is the reflux. The, most of the patients have a lot of reflux, right? So, but this has been settled because we can fix it with a higher hernia repair, right? And the disadvantage is the weight regain, usually after two years, right? So because of this is quite promising procedure. And so, and we know the weight regain is a problem. And the one thing is, what you notice is that that is almost no malnutrition in the stiff gastrectomy, all right? But the one thing is the because of the weight regain. So we were thinking of uh, combining a sleep gastrectomy with other procedures, right? And you when you do this, we are not looking at the mouth absorptive part. We are not looking at the part, but rather we are looking at hormonal part. So just now I told you hormonal is foregut and hindgut, right? So sleep gastrectomy is actually a foregut and hindgut. We haven't settled the satiety, right? So the satiety, you can either do a duodenal switch, you can do a, this is sadis, right? You can do a blue and white DJB, you can do a loop DJB, you can do an interposition, you can do a PJB, right? There's a lot, right? But I'm not going to tell you all this because all this, most of them are experimental. And the, I just described a few, maybe two, right, to you guys, so that you guys roughly know. And this is the ceiling, okay, this BPD, BPD with a diodonal switch, this is a ceiling, right, the most difficult procedure, right, because namely because you have to transect the diodonal. The, the thing is, diodonal, if pancreas is your wife, huh? diodonal is your mother-in-law, all right, so you don't want to go and catch out your wife and mother-in-law, right? Okay. <laughs> because the other nerve is, is very vascular. It's rich in, vascu in uh, vasculature. So if you are not careful, you bleed. When it bleed, you cry, right? So the principle is the reduction of the grading for sleep. We increase GLP from the distal ileum and mouth absorption from the long bipilin. Advantage is quite promising. 75 to 90%. In 12 months and the remission of the most comorbidities this advantage of it you still have the advantage of malabsorption uh, malnutrition the malnutrition here is namely for diarrhea because of a short common channel and vitamins there are some vitamins right and also protein and the learning curve is very high because you're in malaysia this is actually your mount kinabalu all right so this is your highest uh, can we do said this instead? Said this is you have to do like two anastomosis, but said this is only one. Mm -hmm. Sorry, something hang. Okay, so you see, said this is only one anastomosis, right? Or said this, we can always, we can always, uh, can also say this as a DJB, right? It's a durable bariatric surgery, uh, procedure. The principle is the same, you increase the ghrelin. We reduce the gradient, we increase the GLP. The common channel can be 250 to 300, right? And the advantage, you can go up to 95% of excess weight loss. And remission is about 95% as well. Uh, the disadvantage, the learning curve is very, very high. And the malnutrition is also noted, but it's actually related to the shorter length of the common link. You can actually revise that if you want to, lah, right? And one of the new key in the block, and it's quite a durable bariatric procedure. And this is actually a new procedure that has been revisited because this procedure has been done in 1950s. Right, even uh, actually it's one of the first procedure that been introduced when the bariatric surgery is being discovered. I mean, be, be not discovered, uh, being, being popularized, right? But the thing is, somehow it's lost favor but now it's been revisited because the principle if you look at the hormonal point of view it reduces the gradient it increases glp and the common channel you can go up to 250 or 300 all right 
assess weight loss you can same like your this right up to 95 percent uh this advantage the learning curve here is actually lower than a sadis all right and the problem with that is not much study has been done yet for pjb right so any other question you can just put in the chat box if not i have been like you know i mean just talking to myself okay all right uh, so, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. it's already Joanna. 9 9 p.m already so we would like to remind you a bit oh, okay okay yeah okay, okay. It's very interesting yes oh sorry yeah. <laughs> 9 p.m already okay all right i i i i get i won't see my time sorry but the thing is uh, indication of mbf is the definition you must have less than 5% weight loss after six months uh, of non-surgical therapy, which is your GLP-1. You can have your, uh, we call it anti-obesity medication. Okay, you can have BMI more than, if you have no comorbids, BMI more than 37.5 is indicated already. All right. So if, more, if you have a metabolic syndrome or you have increased cardiovascular risk, which is a, uh, hypertension, diabetes, or hypercholesterolemia, all right? You have a BMI of 32.5. It's already indicated for surgery. And if it's less than 32.5, and no, no comorbids, don't do it, all right? You can only do when you're a guru, all right? You must be under clinical studies. And the clinical issue is dehydration, you can have mal malnutrition, you can stoma ulcers, you can also have a high hernia and GERD, and weight regain you know, is the most important uh, issues uh, around MBS, and also depression. We have uh, depression is higher in post uh patients. Okay, so I would like to tell you about MDT. La. Everything is not MDT. You, you, it's not the surgeon alone you can you can you can uh champion the world but uh you need a barricade surgeon the most important thing uh player is actually a case manager dietitians your physical coach and also the paramedics uh, which your ordinance or what nurse you need a registry and also a social worker to make it work right so the recommended follow up for dietitian you are talking about nutrition and diet physical coach Pre and post op, uh, you can have the structured fitness exercise. Case manager, you, your case manager is important because you follow up the case, the expected result and target the what procedures is done, what complication and also compliance, right? And psychiatrist or psychologist is also one of the important uh, key player in the team uh, because all patients need to be screened, all right? And surgeons, of course, surgeons is the technician, uh, okay? We expected result, the the target, the procedures, and also the compliance, right? Registry. I want to talk about registry. Definition of a high volume center according to it. So you must have a experienced MDT. Your core case volume must be more than twenty two hundred cases per year, and also the complication rate must be low, lower than the standard, nah. Okay. So this is, I would like to introduce you this IPSO, right? IPSO is an international body. And one thing I would like to uh, highlight on registry, registry, registry. Okay, so Joanna asked me to get some example of clinical cases, just a quick one. So this Mr. AB, he did a sleep gastrectomy and a PJP. We did it in the CMUH. And this is his picture in July. And this is his picture in April. And if you look at the progress, right, fat, this is fat mass. Huh? And the muscle mass, the most important thing, if you look at the weight, actually the weight is reducing, right? The BMI is reducing, but with sleep PJB, what happened was the fat mass reduced, but the muscle mass is, remains about the same. This is what we want. This is one of the success story, right? If you look at the blood results, he was diabetic, all right? 120 is actually prebiotic. They are pre-diabetic, all right? But this is more than 5.6, right? It's actually pre-diabetic pre -diabetic as well. But now it's already 5.7. And the serum insulin was 20, right? Serum insulin, the normal value is 4. Now it's 4 already. 
the cholesterol is high and actually low. Actually, you just look at them, just doing a stiff BJB, they can they can have this one. Oh, you. Okay, so uh, okay, so that is the video she gave me. That's the patient. This patient is a female patient, and also she did the stiff BJB from May to February. And you just look at her, her index, the fat mass. I want you to look at the fat mass. The fat mass has been reducing, but the muscle mass remains about the same. So that's why this is what we need. And she is diabetic. And now she is not diabetic anymore. No medications, right? And the, also you look at the serum insulin is also reduced. And the cholesterol level have been reduced, right? So for this, I would like to, with the grace of uh, the chairman, right? I would like to promote a little bit, lah. Huh? Okay, Mugis. So if you guys want to see face to face, okay, we can have a chitty chat, right? You can come to Mugis. This is in Pitang in July twenty six to twenty seven, right? And also Pensa. This year Pensa that means internet uh, is Asian. Uh? Asian, Asian, uh, parental and uh, anterior nutrition, uh, society. Pensa, you talk uh, more about nutrition in this Pensa. This is also very good. This is seven to ten. This is actually near you. This is Shangri La Hotel. All right. So I think I have uh stopped my presentation and uh, this is uh any questions I can entertain. All right.